Um, I can imagine like talking to the engineering team and be like, okay, George, like, uh, is there one soldier or there two soldiers? I'm like, nope. Can we not have a soldier? We don't know because we have a lot of stuff to build, right? Um, I think what's really interesting about this is that he needed these studies to, to figure out the space. It's really hard to figure out how the whole system is going to work together. And so you just take smaller parts of it. Take something that, that feels instinctively like the right place to go, and just go there and start figuring it out. Because you know, large systems are rife with unknowns and unpredictable emergent properties. They're full of dragons. Dragons like on the edge of those old maritime zone maps, like you know, go to the edge of the world and like here there be dragons. I looked up a long time for this quote and I couldn't find somewhere that actually said this, so we I can say this. <laughs> There's also this sort of aspect of and what lives above the surface and what lives beneath the surface. And our users get exposed to the, the top. Uh, there's often so much underneath that how we can't really shape the UI the way we want to. Because of underlying decisions or architecture or how our organization is set up. So we get like, man, this UI sucks. It's like, well, there's a lot of stuff, you know, that's contributing to that. And so when you're going to redesign all these things, you have to deal with all the stuff underneath. So I'm just show you briefly what the lightning experience is, uh, and then we'll talk about how it actually came about. So on the left is traditional ex existing Salesforce. We call that Aloha or, or Salesforce Classic. And there's still a lot of people that are using this. Um, and on the right is lightning, which we announced uh, last year with Dreamforce. You can see it's on the surface, you know, on the top of the tip of the iceberg, it's very visually different and more engaging and more interesting sort of looking. Um, but it took a lot of work to, to move that iceberg. Now the next few slides are a bunch of um, slides I ripped off from marketing department. And they've got like a bunch of like marketing kind of stuff in it. But I, I put them in here because I just want to show you the the, the breadth of what Salesforce does. So I think you think of Salesforce, think, oh, salespeople use that software. And that's true. There's a lot of salespeople that use our software. Um, but it also gets used in a lot of other industries, and it's, it's actually more of a platform. So this is the Lightning experience you know, across a bunch of devices. So you're thinking about the ecosystem of devices that people use. Um, you know, we've got a bunch of customers moving on to it. This is the actual sales product in Lightning. This is service, so we also do service. Uh, so if you call a call center, there's you know, a chance that they're using Salesforce software uh, to help answer that call and solve that case. We're also doing field service now, so this is like when a technician goes out to a locale to help fix something, or deal with their cable box, or they're out doing some industrial sort of work. Uh, we also have an app cloud platform, so you can build things on top of the cloud, uh, build things with the, on top of essentially the local database that's underneath Salesforce and build your own apps. Financial services is near what vertical we're in as well. Uh, health is another one. Communities, there's actually a ton of uh, companies that use us to build their online communities and do yeah, yeah, essentially yeah, self service yeah. through communities. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Analytics, yeah. so taking a very large amount of yeah. analytics on it. Yeah. And marketing, so being able to do uh, sort of pre campaigns and uh, drip campaigns, uh, to do uh, the first part of the customer interaction is marketing. So that's a lot, of, a lot of stuff we do. And then on top of like all those things, it's also fully customizable. So you can take one of these pages and say, well, here's my, my sales site. Oh, I have these kind of four stages. Like, well, we have five stages. OK, well, you can take one of these out and change it. And you can take that sales cycle thing, like, oh, I want this thing to download on the page. Or I want this information over here. And so it becomes this very personal, personalized or customized. So we have 
right through apps. And this is this is both the bane of our existence as designers, and it's also the most powerful thing about the software, okay, is that people want to customize it. It makes our jobs difficult because we have to scale to all kinds of crazy places we wouldn't imagine with product control. So as we went through this project, um, and you, you, you know there's sort of dragons in doing this sort of thing, or what sort of things are going to emerge that might be unexpected, I can tell you uh, at least three things you can expect when dealing with a large ecosystem and taking out data sometimes. So one of those would be you will have to create new processes. So new processes by bringing together different systems that your users will experience. Because you're going to combine these things and be like, yeah, it's kind of dumb, but we have this thing and that thing, we should make it, make it better, and that will bring them together. You will also need to create new processes for yourself of how to work through this model. You will have to define a new set of rules about how the whole system works. This is stuff the engineers are very interested in. It's like, how, how's this all going to work? And you're going to have to make compromises. So if you're not going to get everything you want, what are the choices you're going to make in order to, to shift this thing to get it out? So let's talk a little bit about uh, creating the processes. So, where do you start on something like this? Right, something this large and this vast? Um, we started where design always starts, you know, at the messy beginning. Right? And trying to figure out the space, talking to our users, uh, looking at the overall ecosystem. And what I think one of the interesting things we did was we, we did two different design tracks. One track was we called Adapt, and one was called Invent. And the Adapt track was like, hey, what if we kept a lot of the stuff we had, we just kind of updated it a bunch of places and make it kind of look, we take care of all the weird things and just make it look better and function look better. So that's one track. Uh, and we fixed a bunch of the APIs. And then in the Invent track, it was like, hey, what if we really looked more deeply at how people are using the various systems and we invent some new ways of doing that? And so in this example, over the left, we've got, hey, let's just, uh, we have our users work with a lot of lists. And so, hey, we look a little bit like, you know, here's this, but there's some different explorations how we define how these lists look. And the right is like, hey, let's do a Kanban board where as you have a sale that goes through different processes, you can actually just pick up and move across. And that's how you move it, instead of a checkbox or something. So that was really, uh, it was really great. And what it did is it allowed us to diverge in those two different areas, and then later we brought them back together. Another thing we did was we dove in on a particular area. So this is what we call the opportunity workspace. And it's kind of like doing that study that it's rocked with you, right? So instead of trying to figure out, hey, let's figure out the whole architecture and how everything works at once, let's go deep on one thing. And the things that we learn in there will help inform how the rest of the system is supposed to work. And so this, this was something that came out of the invent track. And this was, um, instead of like, you know, users just putting a bunch of information into the system to track how their deals are doing, let's give them a place to actually work in the system. So from here, they can send emails or create events and follow up with customers. And here versus just the plugging information into a form. Um, as far as our own internal processes went, we had a lot of big meetings. Um, this is a, we have a monthly sprint review. And you can see here, we had a lot of uh, high level stakeholder uh, buy-in as well in this process. So right, right here, in this row right here, this is our president of product, this is our co-founder, this is our president, uh, I'm sorry, the president of engineering, this is our president of product, uh, also our EVP product. So their names collectively spell out spam. <laughs> so we would just say, are you having an spam meeting? Uh, so it's, it's an endearing term. Uh, but it was great to have that sort of executive level uh, involvement and interest in it. So we would go through features, talk through it, and they would help us kind of like you know, guide the business. We'd also do Friday lunches. 
And instead of it being a more formal thing like this, where people were demonstrating uh, functionality, you kind of show anything, something in whatever state it was. Right? So it's a very informal sort of piece. And so people just be like, hey, we got this thing to work, and here it is. It looks kind of ugly, but it does it. And this API finally works or something. And then we can demo that. In the back, you can also see this is an interesting thing we did. We created posters uh, for various large for swaths of functionality. And we, we took these posters, we printed them out really big, we actually put them up here and a bunch of places throughout the various buildings where we worked. So we kind of spread the word about here's how this thing is going to be, right? Helping paint that future state. We used the heck out of Google Docs um, and Google Slides. And uh, there's a couple times we almost broke it, but it seems to have gotten better. Um, but there are times of many, many people, you know, maybe 100 people looking at a pack at the same time. And it was great because what we did is we, we did, sometimes we'd ask, like, hey, where are all the designs in like previous projects? So we made an inventory deck. We took like the hero screenshot or screenshots from that particular area, kind of whatever state they were in, like sketches or more of a comp sort of look. We put them into the deck. And that way, if you want to get a sense of like the whole swap of stuff you were doing, you kind of skim through it. Right? And if you want to dive in on something, there are ways to do that and we're going to like deeper decks that go into more functionality. Um, but it was great, you can see like, um, you know, you can see the comments that were in here. People could point to stuff and be like, hey, how is this going to work? It was that uh, really good interface for us to communicate with. And then we also did a lot of um, looking at cross-functional flows. So this is a jamming on, you know, trying to find bugs. System does this thing. Uh, we need to create a new set of rules. I would say when you create a new set of rules like this, the system really big, you just go. Because you could spend a lot of time uh, imagining what that state would be, or having arguments about, well, it should be like this versus that. And I think, what I kind of like about this picture is that this boat is just going, and it's creating form, right, by just going. And so, what the rules are are revealing themselves uh, by getting into the space. And so we, we allowed the different designers to do it as well. So we didn't worry about like, oh, make sure when you're showing information this way, that it looks like this. Make sure you're using this icon for that sort of thing. We, we had some of those ideas, but we said just go kind of nuts. Figure out what do you need to have on your screens to make things work. And then we took all of those and found the common patterns throughout them. And that helped inform uh, this site, which then eventually became our living design system. And so instead of trying to come from the top down and say things will work like this, we let it grow more uh, We explored the landscape by uh, letting the rules sort of emerge on these larger pieces of paper as well. This is one of our designers. This is a very large PDF he's working on. Uh, to explain like how you move through certain uh, pieces of you know, functionality and just printing out large allows us to see it. Amy's going to talk more about the design system uh, and how that kind of came out of it. And then we also, once we got done with all this stuff, we could do some of these sort of hierarchy diagrams uh, to help us explain how the whole system is going to work. Maybe compromises. You will not get all the ponies. <laughs> Much as we might see one like a particular thing, um, there's just it's just too big uh, to get all, to get all the stuff in. And I really like this deck that's been going around our, our office lately uh, from uh, Hugh Beverly. It speaks to this idea of moving from a sort of object world to a more systems-based world and the trade-offs that you're going to make. And a couple of these that stood out to me was values of like seeking simplicity, that's the old thing. Now we're looking more at like embracing complexity. We're talking about the end state of something being completed. It's more like it's adaptive or growing. And this idea of like the stopping initial, okay, we're done when it's almost perfect, to well, we're done when it's like good enough for now. Sometimes these are hard things for us as designers to, to embrace, but it, it, I think it's a, it's a very interesting take on it. Uh, one of the things we did 
to figure out how to make these decisions was we adopted a core set of principles. And a funny thing that we do at Salesforce is we stack rank everything. So anytime you see like a list of something at Salesforce, someone's presenting something, someone will always ask like, hey, is that list in priority order? And you better say yes. Um, and so we, we have this set of principles uh, for us to help guide our design thinking, for us to help critique our race designs, and, and then we have to make tough choices. What are we going to err on the side of? And we rank these then of clarity, efficiency, consistency, and beauty. So for instance, we might have a design that's particularly beautiful, but if it was really inefficient, or if it was kind of a little bit hard to understand, hard to remember how to use it, then we would kind of go back to the drawing board. Ideally, we want all these things to come together. Right? But sometimes, we wouldn't get a pony. Right? It's like, okay, what are we going to do? How do we make this at least really clear to use? How do we make it as efficient as possible? And if we have to sacrifice something else for that. So clarity, you know, eliminate ambiguity, enable people to see, understand, and act with confidence. And we want you to be able to go through the most important thing for us is can they successfully compute what they want to do, but over and over? Efficiency, we're going to streamline and optimize workflows. Systems we we wanted to create familiarity and strengthen intuition by applying the same problem, or the same solution to the same problem. And with beauty, we want to demonstrate respect for people's time and attention through thoughtful and elegant craftsmanship. Socializing these sort of things out, it's funny because when we came up with these principles and some of these other things, we didn't really socialize it right away. Uh, we wanted to kind of work it out for ourselves. And I'm always kind of reminded, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, this is a scene from like Mel Brooks's History of the World. And, and the joke is that that uh, Moses comes down from the mountain, right, holding uh, these tablets. He says, the Lord Jehovah has given you, his chosen people, these 15, and he drops one, uh, 10, 10 commandments. <laughs> so when we, took, when we came up with these principles, we didn't actually, uh, like Craig and I, Craig Villamore and I actually did most of the work around them. We didn't actually proclaim them really loudly at first, we kind of tested it internally how it worked. And we would test our design process, and that worked out well, and eventually we spread the word on it, and it's, it's taken a hold in, in the organization. So I think we're almost out of time here. Uh, next steps, we're looking at how do we do a better job of integrating Salesforce with these different stages, right? So there's the world in the states, how do you better observe and capture the state of the world and do some of that stuff automatically for people? How do we help them understand the information that's in the world and that's captured in Salesforce? And how do we let them act again back onto the world? And I think the other thing we're doing that we want to look at now is how do we have these different hubs of content and information and apps? It's not just these different hubs, it's these little spokes right here, right, that connect these pieces. I want to make those fat. How do you get the information from all those things into the other thing? There's a lot of power in those joints, in those connections. That is it. Navigational model from classic to whiten, and if you did, how did you maintain the the, like, the integrity of the system? Like, you can't redesign everything. So, what do you do with the pieces you can redesign? What did you just kind of apply the new look and feel? How did you tackle that to make sure it's still like consistent good experience all around? The, the navigation navigation is like a super tricky problem for us. Um, it's one that I would say we didn't totally nail first time out, and what it's taken is uh, a much more nuanced view of all the navigation. And so what, we've, what we're 
doing now is we are uh, we are expanding the, the ways that people can build and, and essentially declare a navigation system when they're making their own system. And so before it was before it was like in Salesforce it was like one way and in Lightning it's like one way. We want to make it so that here's a suite of navigational systems you can choose based on the thing that you're trying to do. And are they usually by use cases and workflows, or are they usually by industry? It sounds like use cases and workflows. Yeah, it doesn't really apply. It's, it's more of like an information seeking and gathering sort of thing versus an industry. Uh, I have one other question. So, also strategically, when you went through this redesign, how did you tackle it? Like, how did you figure out step by step what you're doing? Are you going by different industries and doing the end to end experience for each industry? Or are you going by features and trying to do the entire feature set and do it for all industries? Well, the all industries at once. We started with uh, our core offering, which is the sales cloud. And that's, that's what we kind of, again, we use that almost like a study, right? So, kind of tackle the whole thing. And so, we use the sales cloud as a way to like dive into it and figure out the rules, and then that is then spread to the other areas of uh, our offerings. Okay. Uh, so my question is that uh, my understanding about Salesforce is many third party and developers are working on top of that, yeah. and uh, the previous questions uh, are kind of step into that uh, area already. Well, my question is about when you're doing the design process, how to get the uh, get the third parties and they are also major stakeholders to keep your platform active. And so how do you get the, the input from them and get their considerations being reflected by the uh, product? That's a really good question. Uh, we have a lot of meetings with our, with our third parties, uh, independent software vendors or partners, uh, and, and get their feedback of what things that they need. Um, I personally have been going to a bunch of those meetings in the last couple of months, and it's been, it's been awesome. Um, so I guess we just we just keep that feedback on the and there's lots of other venues of, of different groups besides UX that interact with those people. So. Uh, uh, are those meetings are more about just getting feedback uh, on their current issues, or did, uh, did they get involved in the process of the design as well? We definitely. Uh, I have definitely involved in the process of design, but I've seen some very forward looking stuff and we get their feedback on it. Hello. Um, so you mentioned during your presentation the complexity and flexibility of the UI um, in Salesforce. And I'm kind of wondering how did you balance the simplicity and the complexity, because every new feature and possibility to modify the UI is uh, adding a lot of development time and also affects uh, features that you want to develop in the future. Yeah. Also, the platforms that you know are existing today but may come up in the future, like VR and so on. How do you find the balance um, yeah, between the simplicity and you know, balancing basically the learning curve? Thank you. It's a very good question. It's funny, I was just talking to some customers this week, uh, Boom Train, and they had a bunch of, uh, I was talking to their account executives who used Salesforce and used it in previous jobs. And a couple of them told me, like, I didn't like Salesforce when I first started using it, and now it's like the best thing I've ever used. Uh, and this is, this is exactly that sort of problem where there's a long ramp towards getting it, it there can be a long ramp towards getting it exactly the way you want it. And then once it's the way you want it, it's, it's like freaking awesome. Um, it's a thing we constantly struggle with and we kind of, we, we constantly work on. Um, as far as like prioritizing, like what things get built when, remember how I said we like prioritize everything? There's, there's long lists of like hundreds of things on it of how we, you know, how, what, does this get prioritized over that thing? Okay, great. That's the thing we're going after it. We just keep working on the list. The question that I had was, you know, whenever you're rebuilding a legacy product, yeah. uh, when you're rebuilding it, you don't see the customer like that much. The legacy customer is just like, hey, I want to keep the facts. It's not going to be time for the product. How do you deal with that if you're rebuilding something from scratch? We, um, we communicate to them what's in and what's out. 
and we help tell, we tell them the roadmap of what's coming. So they don't get all the ponies either uh, right away, and so we just, we just have to clearly communicate that. We did not switch people on to automatically. So there's a whole onboarding sort of campaign that says, okay, is lightning right for you? Okay, you know, you answer these sort of questions and, and go through it. So a lot of communication, a lot of partnership uh, just to make it happen. Hey, JD, thanks a lot. Um, I'm also working on a design system at a big company, and um, I'm just curious if you could tell us some details about the logistics and resourcing, how many people were involved, and what was the organizational structure? Sure. Um, there were over 50 scrum teams uh, that worked on it. Each of those teams is probably like, I don't know, six, seven engineering certified. So there's also QE, and there's UX, there's like 100 people in our organization. And maybe closer to 50 in UX. There's stock writing and there's uh, all the implements. I, I, I don't know. I, can't, I don't know the number offhand. Yeah. Were all those people contributing full time to the lighting design system? Yeah. To to the design system or to lighting like the to the actual design system. To oh, to the design system. But Amy can speak to that. She's going to talk next. Thank you. Yeah. And that's a good segue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much.